video uh, and we're screen sharing, so progress. Uh, no promises beyond that. Uh, let's see. Um, all right, so this class is Data Science 100. So the expectation is that uh, it's kind of an intro class into the data science field, uh, whether you want to be a data scientist or whether you just want to get to be able to manipulate data. Uh, and to start off, I will try to select the right screen. Uh, this is me. Um, so I spent about 15 years in boutique software consulting. And it's kind of funny is like every time I teach more about data science, I realize periodically that um, some of the projects I worked on were actually data science, but we didn't call it that then. So I didn't realize it at the time, but it's kind of amusing. Um, you all can hear me, right? Back in the way back, obviously. All right. Uh, so I also spent some time as a camp counselor. So I'm usually pretty good with my volume. Uh, I just spent about eight years at Red Hat. Has anybody heard of Red Hat? Raise your hand if you've heard of Red Hat. All right, not bad. Um, Red Hat is the uh, not very well-known company that's behind a lot of Linux, which is an alternate operating system to Mac and Windows. But if you've used that thing called the internet before, may ring a bell, uh, most of the websites that you're like, visiting or whatever, most of those actually run on Linux. And so the biggest provider of that is this company called Red Hat. However, its distinguishing characteristic is that everything that they sell is actually what's called open source. So in other words, you can just go download the code anytime you wanted, and it would just work, and you can use it for free. What you're paying them for is to get updates more quickly, uh, and then if you get sued because you're operating something because the software is potentially owned by somebody else, uh, Red Hat will, will take that lawsuit for you. Uh, so it's a very interesting business model. If you are interested in business, um, you should definitely look them up uh, because they are neat. Um, and then I spent, uh, while I was at Red Hat, I spent about three years as an in expert in residence at Spark. Um, we used to call it engineer in residence, now it's called expert. Does anybody know what the Spark program is at BU? Can you tell us? Yeah, I'm a journalism intern. I, I work at Spark. Business. Okay, so Spark is uh, basically a unit within the Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences, which is where data science is housed. Uh, that tries to give experiential learning to what we jo jokingly refer to as tech adjacent uh, uh, degrees, generally speaking. Uh, so if you want to go and do a project in software engineering, or you want to go do a project in data science, or you want to do a project with journalism, which is the other class I'm teaching this fall, actually, um, you can join these classes or their internships or various other programs. You can also uh, bring your own idea if you want to do like a startup or whatever. And you want to work on a real world third party project and so orchestrate that so for that i used to provide guidance on tech stack and technology choices and things like that but i also taught some of the classes while i was still working right now uh, and then these are my kids very hard to get them all in the same picture at the same time uh, the tall one there is currently a bucknell uh, so it's kind of funny that we have two people at bu um, but they're not the same thing uh, that uh, or call it caricature, uh, is uh, from one of the big projects I worked on at uh, Red Hat. If you want to know more about Linux or Red Hat or what I did there, uh, see me later because it's a, it's kind of scary deep. Um, all right, and then so we also have Rohan, who's over here. Um, and so he is our teaching assistant for this course. Uh, and as you can see, he's got some varied skills. Um, we, of course, actually call it football, not soccer, um, you know, for most of the world. Uh, but you know how this, uh, I also have played uh, for many, many years. Um, we will also have a couple of course assistants uh, joining us, um, but everything's like just a little bit late this semester. I don't know why. So uh, they'll probably be around maybe for the next lecture, definitely for the discussion sections, uh, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Um, but I want you to know who Rohan is because uh, if you don't want to come and talk to me during office hours, you can go and talk to him during office hours. You can also talk to the course assistants once they're introduced during office hours, et cetera. Questions so far? All right. Uh, let me just actually make sure. Is this actually recording? Yes, okay, good, just check. All right, so mechanics. Uh, Y'all found the room. Uh, I don't know if there's 120 people in here, so hopefully you're all here, I don't know. Um, course time, as you also seem to have figured out. Uh, and then this is also fall, which I will constantly forget and uh, regularly get confused about. So if you randomly see spring, it'll be because I forgot which semester it is. Uh, but that's my contact information. You can reach me at that email address, um, or you can come and visit me 
me during my office hours. I also do on-demand office hours over Zoom, uh, and you can get to that by, we'll talk about that in a minute, but I have a link that you can like schedule with me. Uh, Rohan is the same, um, so he's actually going to be using, uh, so does anybody know where MCS is, or the Math and Computer Science Building? Anybody know where that is? Raise your hand. All right. I know it's 3.30 in the afternoon, so everybody's like half asleep, but you know. Uh, so MCS is down, you know where the big fancy new building is across the street? That's MCS. It's kind of behind Warren Towers. Uh, so that's where my office is. And in the basement there, uh, there's uh, basically a big open room called, that's part of Hariri, which is a research institute. That's where Rohan's going to hold his office hours. So it's kind of my office on the first floor, and then he'll be holding his office hours on the bottom floor. Um, at least at this point. We may change it. We'll see. Um, so, oh, there's a bug. I knew I was going to catch this. So basically, because we're starting this semester on a Tuesday, uh, it threw me all off because every other semester I've taught any class, it started on my first lecture was on a Thursday. So everything is now Thursday based rather than Tuesday based. So this should say Thursday. So homeworks will be due by the uh, beginning of class on Thursdays because we'll release them on Thursdays. They're due a week later. Make sense? Uh, till after Thanksgiving, then things get launched. But we'll talk about that more too. Um, so if you haven't signed up for Piazza yet, please do so. You should already be in Blackboard. If you are not, let us know. Uh, you should also already be in Gradescope. If you are not, let us know. Piazza does not have an automatic sync, so you have to go and sign up for that yourself. Uh, I will also show those tools to you uh, in a few minutes. All right, so what is data science? Well, the easy answer is preparing and understanding data using mathematics and software. So we have this fancy new term because statistics doesn't really work much anymore. Anybody know why that might be? And there's a big hint on the right side of the slide. It's too much data. It's too much data, right? So, so stats, I mean, the techniques work just fine, but if you try to do them by hand, right, you're gonna be there the rest of your life, okay? So as a result, computers have become a very big part of doing anything where you're trying to understand or manipulate data. So as a result, we kind of come up with this new term, which is data science, which is this blend between computer science, okay, and statistics, all right? So you don't need to be a computer scientist to understand this stuff, and you also don't need to be a statistician to understand this stuff, but you need to have some knowledge of both in order to be successful. So by way of comparison, um, some terms that you may not have ever heard of before, but it's anybody, you know, the term bit, okay? So a bit is that on, off, or true, false, okay? Has anybody ever noticed that there's a power button on most devices these days, you know, that take electricity? It's like a circle and it has like a line through it. That's because it's zero and one, okay? And it's on, off. Well, actually, off, on, right? So zero is off and one is on. That makes sense? That's why that design is the way it is is because of a bit. So maybe you know why we care about a bit in kind of the computer world? It's the smallest part of uh, any, it's the smallest uh, kind of part of the computer science language and all, it works with the electrical, the electric signals is what makes everything powered physics. Okay. Um, everything's right, so, so the short answer, although you're not wrong, right? The short answer is that because it's binary, Okay, and the reason it's binary is because what you're getting at is because electrical signal is either on or off. Okay, and actually, if you really want to go advanced, this is why quantum computing is so weird because you can have multiple states, right? Not just on and off. So that's why it's it's very odd. Um, but we won't get into that today. But that's why we care about binary systems. It's why we care about zeros and ones. Okay, because everything is out of two, basically zero or one. So the next big up, next big thing is a byte which is actually eight bits, okay? And basically it's one character, okay? Do y'all know why I say character? What is it? What is a character? Uh, besides, you know, some of you meet on the street who might've been, you know, a little bit deep in the drinks. Use English slang. Anybody else know what a character means? It's like a letter you type here. A letter you type. So why don't I just say letter? Uh, numbers could also be part of it. I don't know. Oh, I was like, who's speaking? Uh, yeah, so it could be numbers. It could be letters. What else could it be? I mean, just any unit of information. Like single letters. 
Right, so it's a single unit of information, and that's where it gets really confusing because it'd be numbers or letters. And when we say letters, especially as Americans, right, we tend to think of English letters, right? But think about all those fancy characters you have in all other scripts, right? Those also need to be represented. And so that's what a byte is meant to be about. Technically speaking, not all of them fit in that anymore because computers are English centric, um, just as a bias. All right, so then that kilobyte, okay, is a thousand bytes, okay? So it uses the metric system, generally speaking. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. But just to give you a sense of scale, 200 word essay, give or take, okay? Um, obviously, if you use really big words, it's gonna be fewer words, right? Because it's actually counting the characters, not the words themselves. All right, and a megabyte is about one minute of music, okay? All right, and then a gigabyte is 230 songs. Okay, so how much can you think about how much is in your computer, right? How many gigabytes of storage do you have on your computer itself, right? Probably hundreds of megabytes, uh, sorry, hundreds of gigabytes, right? So a terabyte, I made another TV show, Avatar. Who's seen Avatar? The Airbender one? Airbender, yes. That one. Um, the, uh, it's funny because uh, I'm getting fewer and fewer people who've seen that in my classes. It's like I'm going to have to look for the next. You know, like the next TV show everyone has seen. Um, but so the entire series, okay, is one terabyte. All right. So just to give it, like I said, just trying to give you a sense of scale. So everybody know what the US Library of Congress is? All right. Can you tell me what the US Library of Congress is? I thought I heard somebody say something. Feel free to shout it out or raise your hand. All right. So the US Library of Congress is uh, basically this vast, set of knowledge it used to be every single document that was created like every single like publication or magazine or whatever in the u.s was cataloged in the u.s library of congress it's gotten to be less true now it's more like seminal works because we're producing so much of this stuff that they just can't house it all so now it's only big stuff in a sense but if you look at the entire u.s library of congress it's 74 terabytes all right so again pretty good size but we have petabytes on here. We have a bunch of others, so it's not that big. Um, a petabyte is three and a half years of video. The human brain is theorized to store about two and a half petabytes. Okay. Now the human brain is a little bit wonky in this regard because the storage of information is actually not what makes you smart, right? It's just that's just kind of parts of it. But if you just kind of boil it down to the amount of knowledge that can be held in the human brain is two and a half petabytes. Exabyte. All words ever spoken by mankind, five exabytes. Okay, that's a lot, right? But like every word ever spoken by mankind is only five exabytes. Then we talk about a zettabyte. So if you think about it, I couldn't even find an example of this, right? So if you think about one gigabyte being one brick, that's 258 Great Walls of China. Okay, you can see the Great Wall of China from space, right? It's it's good size if you're unfamiliar. All right, so that's a lot of data. So then we have this, okay? This is the growth of data over time, okay? We are now producing about 2.3 zettabytes of data. Remember zettabyte, Great Wall of China, 258 times of a gigabyte, right? 2.3 zettabytes a year. So that leads us to we might need some science, right? We gotta do, we gotta do something to be able to understand this stuff. Part of the reason for that is that organizations are not sure what they think might be useful later. Okay. So they're just storing everything. Okay. So everything that happens, like every time you go to a website, every single click that you do, every time you load a page, every time uh, you know, a lot of sites will even look at how far down a page you scroll. Um, they just collect everything, every transaction that you do, you know, if you spend money, obviously, but other kinds of transactions as well. Like, did you sign up for a mailing list? Did you, you know, answer a survey question, et cetera. All of that gets stored about every website, okay? It's basically unheard of not to capture as much information as you possibly can. Even though most organizations know they may never figure out what they're going to do with it. All right, does that make sense? You hear about this in the news fair amount, right? Like look at Facebook, for example, AKA Meta. Um, they regularly get trashed for doing this kind of thing. So does Google, 
Okay. However, it's like if you're a business, you don't you don't know what you're going to look for. But now you have this flip side problem of how do you understand it to be able to do anything with it? That's useful. All right. So what are we doing in this class? Well, we're going to talk about an introduction to the field. So you get an idea of what data science is, kind of the approach, the methodology, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and then we're going to also hopefully identify some structured techniques for identifying what my youngest son terms bullshit. Uh, and uh, I particularly like this term, so I'm going to continue to use it uh, and hopefully continue to embarrass him as much as possible. So everybody, I assume, knows what I mean by bullshit. Um, and then the other thing is how to avoid presenting your own bullshit. Okay. Have you ever heard the quote, lies, damn lies, and statistics? Right? It's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of serious. It's really easy to mischaracterize things using statistics because you have two tricks. One, you cannot present all of the information, and we'll actually, in like six or seven lectures, I'll show you some pretty decent examples of that. But you can also, because it's math, throw up numbers that you say mean stuff, okay? And even if they're accurate, people will look at it and just kind of glaze over because it's math, right? Because they're numbers and they won't really mean anything. That's kind of why I go to do this slide, right? It's because I can say zettabyte to you all day. Is that going to mean anything to you, right? Even a gigabyte, like, do you really have any idea what that is? Like how big that is? Not really, most people don't. It's actually a big, been a big trend or there was a big trend on, I want to say it was up mostly on TikTok, uh, and some other kind of places around the internet where they were kind of showing, like trying to get you to understand how much a billion dollars really was, right? And like just, you know, all kinds of different visualizations to try to get your head wrapped around how much money that really is. Because it's really hard. Humans aren't very good with large numbers, okay? All right, uh, and then hopefully have some fun with data. Uh, most of the data we look at is publicly available. Um, actually, all of it is publicly available, um, and mostly to do with kind of socially interesting topics. Okay, uh, so you know, part of what we try to do in this class is show you why data science is really interesting, no matter what your other interests are. Okay, so we talk about journalism a little bit, right? So investigative reporting uses a lot of data science. Okay, sociology. You want to try to figure out trends in, I don't know, maturity. Um, you know, that's going to be data science as well, maybe off of census data, okay, or political science, that's a really common one. Today is actually primary day in Massachusetts, and if you are new to Massachusetts, primary day is incredibly important because the only people who usually um, actually get elected in uh, Massachusetts are Democrats. So as a result, how you're going to win the election is by winning the primary day. Right, because it's only amongst the Democrats. Because once you get to the actual election, it'll be a Democrat versus a Republican, maybe an independent or two. Um, and so, as a result, whoever's up on that Democratic candidacy is very likely to be the winner. So, as a result, primary day is very, very important. So, even though it's not a big election day today, it's very important in Massachusetts. But knowing those kinds of things takes data science as well. So just some examples, um, but we'll also talk about it in terms of uh, stats and kind of true data science. So if what you want to do when you, you know, when you grow up, I'm still trying to figure it out. Let me know if y'all do, uh, but you know, like a year ago, I took a hard left on my career and said, hey, why don't I become a professor for a while? Eh, since that's fun. Um, so what I'll say though is that, uh, you know, if you want to grow up and do uh, data science for a living, right? You want to develop the next new algorithm or you want to develop the next new, cool technique using neural networks and machine learning, that's, hopefully this will ground you for that as well. All right, so uh, what do we expect when you walk into this class? Uh, so th some things that may be occurring to you, right? Coding, high-level math, stats, and bullshit. So we don't expect any knowledge of coding whatsoever. I don't expect you to even really know what coding means, okay? We will try not to use, well, we will try to teach you all the jargon. One of the problems with programming is that a lot of our jargon borrows from English. Like, so it's got a very similar meaning, but not quite the same. So character is a good example, okay? Um, but, and so as a result, it can be really confusing. Uh, and so I'll try to explain any of those terms before I use them. 
Um, however, I do fail periodically because I've been saying, you know, I've been using this jargon for most of my adult life, right? So occasionally I'll fail. High level math, no, not really. We're gonna do some pretty lightweight math. You should have, you know, kind of arithmetic, but I don't expect strong algebraic or, uh, you know, trigonometric or any of those kinds of functions. Uh, and we'll talk about some statistics. Uh, again, you don't need to have, you shouldn't need to have any knowledge of these things going in. Um, however, I do expect that you can recognize Bolsher when you see it, if it's presented after, right? Questions? All righty. As you can tell, I find it very warm in this room. So, all right. First off, uh, the syllabus. The syllabus for every class is a contract you're making with the professor, okay? How many people have ever, ever written or, or you know, signed a real contract? Raise your hand if you, if you signed a contract. Why are contracts important? It prevents either side of the contract to break the contract. Or okay. Deal. Hold you accountable. Hold you accountable, right. So if you don't agree with the contract, you should let us know, right? I'm not saying we'll change it, but you are kind of signing up for something. So keep that in mind. So maybe you should read it, right? All right, but things I should point out, right, is that here are the things you should definitely read. Here are some things that, eh, you know, it's up to you, all right? But definitely check out the course description so you have an idea of what our goal is, like what we're trying to get you to understand in this class. And that's actually what some of this is too, is like, what do we want you to walk away from this class with? Books, okay, and other course materials, that's important sections as well. Courseware, we're gonna show you those a little bit, um, but they are important to at least have a rudimentary knowledge of. You don't need to be super deep into them, but they are useful. The assignments and grading section, so what things that you need to put more effort into than others, okay? How to succeed in this course, uh, we wrote a section about like what you can do to make sure that you get an A in this class. Okay, and then the last thing is the tentative schedule. So I'm a little dicey on the last quarter or last third of the semester at this point, but I do have a whole schedule in there that tells you when homeworks are due, when labs will be due, when the projects are due, when the midterm is, when the final exam is. Well, not the final exam because we don't actually know yet. We just know what we, it'll be, right? Um, so that way you can kind of align it with your other classes, right? Because what you don't want to be doing is like if you have two midterms on the same day, finding that out the day before when you have to study the both, right? So keep that in mind, use the other ones. Most syllabi have something like that as well. Uh, and use that when you're trying to do your planning. I do recommend doing some kind of plan for the entire semester. All right, so I wanted to show you these real quick if we can. And hopefully it'll go not terribly, you never know. So um, actually let's start with Piazza. Um, oh boy. Just grab and typing over your shoulder. Um, and sign it over here. That's going to take a while. All right, so Piazza, I generally refer to, except it will mean nothing to any of you because probably none of you were alive in those days, but a 1990s forum. Um, it is incredibly awesome. Um, so we have this nice, awesome 1990s forum user interface, but a couple things I want to point out. Ask questions here, okay? You can ask them anonymously if you're nervous, right? If you think it'll make you sound stupid or whatever. Um, but if you ask questions here, then other people can A, answer you potentially, or B, if they have the same question, or if they didn't realize they had the same question, they can also kind of collect the same information. There's some rough categories up here. I'm not, I'm inclined to just say there's just one category, but you know, if you want to group them, it forces you to put it in a folder. Um, so you know, pick, pick the most appropriate one. Don't worry if you're too wrong. But the other thing I like to point out is this resources tab, okay, which a lot of people, even if they've used Piazza, don't know is here. Um, so on here, all the homeworks will be listed here. Uh, solutions may not be, 
I can't remember how we're going to do it with this course, but the lecture slides will be here, um, and then any other random files or whatever we want to attach. Um, then the syllabus is also here, okay? Um, and then we also have our office hours here and where they are. And when the course assistants come in, they'll also get added here too. Um, and then there's this course information, which I don't really use, but it's there. All right, that is Piazza. Now we'll talk about Gradescope, maybe. Oh, sorry, the reason I talk about Piazza first is because it's kind of the entry points of the class, okay? So any assignment or whatever will go up here as like a, an event um, every time it goes out. Anything like if I have to change my office hours because I have to go to a meeting or something like that, we'll post it here, et cetera. So anything you want to know that's going on with the class, this is the place to find it. It's kind of the root, okay? Um, you can get, there's a mobile app for it as well. That's not too bad. Uh, so I definitely recommend checking that out um, if you can. Then we'll go to Gradescope, which, where'd my big class go? All right, we'll do a completely unrelated class. Um, so basically, this is great scope. Um, and we have basically, uh, you'll, you'll only see the stuff that is currently available. Okay, so we'll have assignments set up in there, but you won't be able to see them until they're released. Okay, but then you'll come in here and you'll be able to get your grades and, you know, see how you did on a project, get any feedback. And this is the best way you'll get feedback. Okay, on whatever you did wrong or, you know, or on ways that you could have done it slightly better, et cetera. But so that's great scope. Um, you should already be in there based on your BU email address. If you're not, again, let us know. And then lastly, we have Blackboard. Oh, actually not lastly. We're also gonna do Top Hat, but I don't know if I set it up yet. So uh, again, this is my interface, so I'm not sure how much it'll, how it'll look to you. Um, but so let's do another completely unrelated class. Um, You'll see a little bit of announcements here. I don't really use this for announcements. I use Piazza for that, okay? But what you can do here is down in the grade center, you can see what your current standing in the class is, okay? Now, keep in mind, it's rough, right? Because it doesn't take into account things like participation or um, what else do we do in this class? Attendance or, you know, things like that, right? So so it's, a, it's close, all right? Uh, but it can kind of give you a, an understanding of where you are, um, you know, if you see yourself having a C, it might be worthwhile to come to office hours and finding out why, okay? Or if it's wildly disparate from what you think you have, you should come to office hours and find out why, okay? So that's the biggest thing we use Blackboard for. Unfortunately, I can't make grade scope do math across a class. Um, I can only do individual assignments. So as a result, I use this for that. Make sense? All right. Um, and then lastly, which, like I said, I can't remember if I actually set this class up yet. Um, so is another application called Top Hat, which I believe I will, hold on a second. Yeah, I haven't set this class up yet, but okay, I don't care. Um, what we're gonna use Top Hat for is we're gonna use it to take attendance, okay? And we're gonna use it for what are called clicker questions. So in other words, I'm gonna periodically we'll do little polls in the class and you know, you'll answer on your phone and you know, off on your merry way. It gives me a sense of where you're at. Like, do you, do you understand what I just said? Um, you know, am I going too fast? Am I going too slow, et cetera? Um, so you should be able to log into Top Hat. You should be able to get an account. You should be able to use the free version. Um, so, and I'm hope like all the features I use, it tells me, that the version for you is free. Uh, it is fairly likely that another class of yours will also be using Top Hat. Uh, so if you do have to pay for it, I think it's 30 bucks a year. So it's not too shabby, especially considering tuition. Um, but uh, you shouldn't have, if you do have any trouble, if it is a, if it is a gate for you price-wise or anything, uh, please let us know and we will find a way to fix it. Yeah. I, I haven't set it up yet, so we don't have it yet. Uh, so I'll send out another email with Top Hat. Um, I forgot it wasn't in my, because uh, I only used it last semester for the first time. So it's not really like in my my uh, like wheelhouse yet of like all the things I have to set up in a semester. So it is super handy though. Uh, I, I really quite like it. Um, so I do need to set it up. 
right, back to slides. Um, and hopefully this is the most boring class we'll do. All the rest of them will have like actual content. Um, all right, so lecture attendance. Uh, so better to come, okay? Um, you know, we want people to be able to participate in the class, uh, both because of participation rate, but also because the only way you can learn from each other is by hearing what other people say, okay? So I'm gonna ask kind of a weirder question here. Um, one of the things they talk about in the software world a lot these days is diversity and inclusion. So anybody know why that might be important when you talk about say something like data science? Because you're dealing with data, you're dealing with data from a lot of different uh, groups. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, uh, but so some diversity helps with giving different perspectives on the thing they're looking at. Okay. Um, so one of the classic examples of this right now that's been in the news a lot, right, is um, uh, doing like person identification from photos, which works really well on white men. Anybody have any theories about why that might be? Or like, and this is just a theory. I don't know this to be true. Most of their sample size were trained by AI was white men. Okay, why do you think it was mostly white men? Okay. Uh, yeah, training said probably because most um, the, the people who are in the company or whatever. Who's working on it? Do you have something to add back there? Uh, why don't you raise your hand? No? Okay. Um, so, anything else to add? I guess the people running the machine was like that. So, basically, like think about it, right? If you're if you're a team, okay, let's say there's ten people working on it, and all of them are white men, and the way they want to get training data is they just take pictures of themselves or maybe their family, right? But then you have inherent bias built right into the problem. Right, which you may not realize and was completely, you know, may have been completely unintentional. But this is why you need different perspectives on things. One of the ones that I was taught a million years ago, and I have no idea if it was actually true or not, is that you have to design, for example, websites differently based on the audience you're targeting, right? So in the US, uh, having any indication that there's an administrative login to an application usually is negatively taken by the users. Okay. However, and like this is where I'm not sure if it's 100% true or not, um, if you're doing the same kind of application for a Chinese audience, it actually is better to indicate that there's administrative login because then the users feel like there's somebody who's in control, right? And that somebody is actually managing things, which I thought was really interesting. So something as innocuous as whether or not there's an administrative login button is different by culture. How would you know that? if you grew up in one culture, right? So it helps a lot if you can widen the perspectives. And so we'll talk about that in this class, I think a fair amount. Um, and also why we do some of the classwork as group work, because what we wanna do is try to give different perspectives in those groups. We do assign the groups kind of randomly, so you may end up with all the same perspectives, but hopefully not, right? <laughs> Using the, the magic of randomness. All right, uh, so it's better if you come, all right? Uh, and you may miss things that we discussed in class. You know, I make mistakes on the regular. Uh, so hopefully, you know, I've covered them in the lecture and, you know, make corrections, that kind of stuff. Um, recordings should be available, assuming technology doesn't fail me, um, about two weeks after the, any given lecture, okay? Uh, they're mostly posted to YouTube. Um, however, I, do, I don't post video recordings where there's students in it, okay? So if for some reason, you know, there's students on stage or something like that. Uh, we won't post that lecture recording. If you want to see it, you can because you're a member of the class. You just have to request it specifically, and I'll share the Zoom link too. Okay. Um, and let us know if you don't expect to attend. Um, given that we are still having a fair amount of COVID running around, if you are sick or have a close contact, do not come to class. Okay. Um, we will find a way to either let you participate in the class remotely. I just said I'm running Zoom recordings of every class, so I can let you into the class if I need to, or I can get you the recording faster, okay, if we need to. But do not consider being here, you know, in, you know, 
uh, against your health, right? Like, you know, your health should take priority uh, and also the health of everybody else in this class should take priority. Okay, so if you're feeling sick, don't come. All right, let me find the correct window again. I can't find my mouse. There. All right. Discussion in lab. Okay, so uh, you know, if you're new to BU, uh, one of the ways that many BU classes are taught is there's like two lecture sections or three lecture sections, depending on what day of the week it is. But then there's also the, a discussion section. The discussion section is usually much smaller. Um, in this case, I think it's 30-ish students each. Um, in this class, they're all on Fridays, but they, you know, they may be different. Um, and different professors will use them differently. Okay. We use it primarily as a way to do kind of lab work, okay? Um, and does anybody know, or what do you think I mean by a lab in this kind of class? Right, so it's some kind of data science assignment. It's a pretty good way to put it. Um, so think of it as almost like a homework, except you're gonna do it with uh, a group and you're gonna do it with uh, people around. So like Rohan will be there, the course assistant will be there. Uh, so you can ask questions, that kind of thing. We're also going to try to carve out some time during that period to also discuss any questions you might have about the lectures, something you didn't understand, things like that. Um, but there will often be a lab that does have credit. It is part of your final grade. Uh, so attendance is expected at those. Um, so don't expect to start skipping them. They're, they are important. Um, one of the things that there's a lot of work in this class Okay, there's homeworks, there's labs, there's projects. The reason we do that is because the best way to learn the program, which is one of the things we're going to learn in this class, is by just doing it. Okay, uh, it's like it really, really is. It's kind of like playing piano. Like you don't you don't learn playing piano by just reading about it. Okay, you go and play a piano. Programming is very much the same way. If you don't just actually do it, it's very, very difficult to learn. All right. All right, uh, homework. So this is where I, I got a little messed up, right? So, but we're gonna release homeworks during the Thursday class, uh, like literally automatically, it will get released during the lecture. You obviously don't have to look at it during the lecture, but it should be available at the end of the lecture. You can turn it in by 23.59 on Tuesday following the class, okay, to get extra credit. So if you do it early, you can get extra credit. Um, or it is officially due by Thursday, the following class. So basically, you have a week to do all the homeworks. Not every week will have a homework. Yeah. What is the platform you use to submit homework? We'll get to that. Um, yeah, you'll see in a minute. Um, actually, yeah, not exactly. So uh, actually, the platform you use to submit the homework is Gradescope. So the assignments are in Gradescope. The place where you will do the homework is what's called the shared computing cluster or the SCC. Okay. And we will, I'll show you that a little bit today, but then in the discussion section on Friday, um, Rohan will help you set yourself up with it. So there's nothing you have to install uh, anything like that. It's all done in the cloud, um, except this cloud happens to be run by uh, Boston University. Uh, and so you'll do all the work there and then you'll essentially download your answers um, and upload it into Gradescope. And that's how you submit your form. As well as labs and projects. How much time is it? Uh, it says in the syllabus. Ten percent, maybe. I can't remember. Any other questions? Okay. Um, depending on the lecture, the symposium series that's going on for the semester, I may also offer extra credit if you go to one of the symposium talks and submit uh, a write-up. Yeah, of course, you like realize you did it wrong and you did it early. You can, like submit it again. Yeah. So as long as you do it before the deadline, you can submit it as many times as you want. If you find that you can't, it's because we didn't check the box that said multiple submissions are allowed. Uh, just let us know it was a mistake. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Cool. Oh, sorry. Except the recording can be posted two weeks around two weeks after. But will the slides be posted earlier? The slides should be there by end of day of lecture. Um, and so why I say it gets weird a little bit after uh, Thanksgiving is because the way the dates fall after Thanksgiving, I think I release them on Tuesdays and expect them back on Tuesdays. So it's a little bit weird. 
Yeah. Um, is a rate assignment just automatically like a zero? No, uh, it's also in the syllabus. You lose a uh, percentage of points if it's within 24 hours, I think. And then uh, it is an auto, a complete zero if it's after that. Okay. But again, the syllabus is correct. I'm just trying to remember. Any other questions? All right. It's not on Blackboard, it's on Piazza. Yeah. So go down the resources tab, top left corner. Yep. All right, uh, we'll also email it out uh, later, um, or actually I'll probably just link to it. The thing to remember is I'll post it in Piazza, but the, the syllabus may change, okay? It's really only about the schedule part, okay? So like I may decide, you know what, we're moving faster than I expected, so I'm gonna move a homework, like I'm gonna change the homeworks around or something like that. So just keep an eye on Piazza. I will announce it if we change anything about the syllabus, but it'll just be about the schedule. The, the overall contract would be the same, okay? All right, um, this is the book, okay? It is online, it is free, um, and you can go and read any of the chapters there. Uh, there is required reading for each lecture. Uh, that's also in the syllabus, which ones they are. That's another thing that tends to change, right? Is we're moving too fa faster or slower than I initially expected. Obviously, some of the readings may change as well, so just kind of keep an eye on that. But again, anytime I update the, the syllabus, I will post something in Piazza. Um, but yeah, so that book's available. You can download the entire chapters, uh, each individual chapter is a PDF, uh, but I haven't found a way to download the entire book at once. So if you like reading offline, um, you have to go get all the PDFs. It's kind of annoying, but I haven't figured out a much solution for that yet. Uh, so attributions, I uh, one of the things, I come from Red Hat, right? So it comes with open source. Uh, so I am sure to try to follow my copyright law uh, as well as kind of nicety as much as humanly possible. So these are all the pictures I used and the sources, uh, and they are all under a license that allows me to use it in the class. Um, in fact, all of my lectures also have this little tag here, which is CC by NC. Okay, so what that means is Creative Commons license. Okay, so Creative Commons has a bunch of different useful licenses for lots of different kinds of things. Um, I want to be attributed if you use my content, it, but you can do whatever you want with it after that, except use it commercially. Okay, so that's what this set of slides is under. Uh, so if you want to learn more about licensing, um, I am not a lawyer, but I do know a fair amount about it. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting subject. Um, and, you know, something to, especially if you get further into data science, will become more and more important. All right. And then last, I think we go to a demo in theory. So just finish setting it up. All right, so I'm gonna go through this part briefly um, because you'll talk about it more, excuse me, in the discussion section. So what you do is you go to CC, or sorry, SCC dash on demand. Uh, I actually think just SCC works, right? Or not. Okay, so SCC dash on demand, you don't need the one dot BU dot EDU and you will come to this page. What you get here, is you have interactive apps. And what we're going to be using in this class is what's called a Jupyter Notebook, okay, or Jupyter Lab, depending. It's actually two versions of the same thing. This is an open source project uh, that was uh, started a while back and is used basically by data scientists and other people around the world a ton. Okay, it's used a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. We're going to use it with a programming language called Python, okay, uh, which is not a snake, but a programming language. Um, and I'll show it to you in two seconds, but the way you get it, okay, so you don't have to download it and install it yourself, is you go to this little interactive apps, and then you go, theoretically, like use a computer, you go here, you fill in these appropriately, and then you hit launch, and then some couple minutes later, it will show up. The reason this is also important, so this is how you're going to do your homework. This is how you're going to do projects. This is how you're going to do labs. This is also how we're going to do all the lectures going forward. Okay. 
So um, what we do is I'm going to actually distribute a Python Jupyter notebook before class, and then we're going to do it together in class. Okay, so what you have to do before that is you have to spin up or create one of these Jupyter notebook instances, it's called, so that you can participate in the class. Does that make sense? So that's how we take notes is we're actually going to do it. And as I said earlier, right, is like the best way to learn the program is just do it over and over. Um, and so that's part of why we do it that way in this class. That makes sense, everybody? All right. Yeah. Usually how long, how long before the session should we prepare? So that is a very good question. So how long before the lecture or, or the discussion should you prepare the Jupyter Notebook? So uh, if you do it at a normal time, let's say two to three hours before the lecture, it will take minutes to launch. If you do it right before the lecture, so will everybody else be doing. So it will take forever to launch. Okay, so try to play it appropriately, you know, put something on your calendar or whatever that reminds you to do it at like one in the afternoon. Set it up for to make sure because there's a, a number of hours that it's going to be alive for. So I usually use about eight. Um, but basically, you just want to make sure that the window of when you start it and the end of lecture is within that window, right? Um, because that way you can't just like accidentally leave one running all the time because obviously there's limited resources. The cloud being unlimited resources is not true, okay? Uh, it is just other people's computers. It's a great t-shirt with this. Um, so just like, just like the rest of the clouds, uh, this particular cloud has limited resources. So we don't want everybody in this class just to run one for six months, right? We want you to say, eight hours, 12 hours, whatever, um, and do what's appropriate to what you need. That makes sense? Yeah. Now, what's the deal with the duration if you're using Jupyter Notebook for a project that might take like longer? So just because, so the question is basically like, it might take you longer to do a project than eight hours, right? Um, or like at least contiguously. Nothing will be deleted when the, when the instance goes away, okay? You will still have all the files. So as long as, and I was joking about this with Rohan the other day. One of the things you learn as a programmer is uh, to your fingers just automatically hit Control S all the time. You just save all the time because you're so used to computers failing on you that you just save constantly. Okay, same deal here. As long as you're saving regularly, none of your files will be lost. Even your position, like even the what things you have open and all that stuff, will should still be there. Okay, but it definitely won't lose your files. It shouldn't lose your position. Um, so it doesn't matter. You say, I can work on the project for two hours right now. So I set up a two hour instance. I work on it for two hours and then, oops, I actually did. I wanted to do two and a half. I, I ran out of time or I miscalculated or something. Totally fine. It just went away. All the files are, as long as you were saving regularly are all saved. They're all there still. You just go launch a new one and all the files are back. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So when we like launch the thing, is the only thing that we're changing is the hours. Like, what about like the other? We'll walk you through it the first time on Friday. Um, so yeah, you do have to set some of the other settings, otherwise it won't be set up quite right. Um, so it is a little bit more complicated than that, but not by much. Uh, hold on, just a sec. If anybody else have any questions? Let me just figure out where I am. All right, and so then once it's created, once you hit that launch button, it'll actually take you to this page over here. Um, but if it doesn't, or you come back here or whatever, you can just go to there and then you just click connect to Jupyter and it will launch a new window that looks like this. All right, um, oops, let me, sorry, I meant to get rid of that first, I forgot. Um, that should be a little bit easier to read. All right, can you all read that in the back roughly? Okay. Um, so the first thing, so this is um, a Jupyter notebook, okay? So it is characterized by the extension IPYNB, okay? Um, and 
you don't have to worry about that too much, but if you see a file name that ends in IPYMB, then you know it's, it goes to the Jupyter notebook. Um, so the first thing I want to tell you is that this part you can completely ignore. Okay, there will be a chunk like this at the beginning of every Jupyter notebook that you use in this class because there's some setup stuff we have to do that when you become a more advanced programmer, you will worry about, but you don't need to worry about for this class. Okay, so if you want to know more about it, I'm happy to teach you, um, but in office hours. So, make sense? All right, so the first thing I do is I go into this first, what's called a cell. And you can see like it's this blue box, right? And I can make new cells if I wanted to by hitting this plus sign here, okay? And that'll make a new cell. And each cell is representative of a chunk of uh, code that I want to uh, execute, okay? So the way I do that is I'm just gonna do the setup one. I hold down shift and I hit enter, okay? When, I'm, when I have it selected, you can also use the menu and say like run selected cells, um, mode programmers, uh, and most people who use computers a lot, rarely use the mouse. Uh, so you'll see me doing things that'll be mostly on the keyboard, um, but there's usually a menu way to do whatever it is. It's just that I'll usually use something like shift enter, which will execute this. And I don't know if you noticed, but this actually changed from the blank like this to an asterisk was in the middle, okay? Or it can shift eight, right? Yeah, shift eight. Um, and then changes to the number of the item that I am in order, okay? But it's the order I executed, not the order in the file. So if I ran this one first, and then I ran this one, this would have a one and that would have a two. That makes sense? Okay. So sometimes that's important because you're like, why is this working weirdly? And it's because you ran them in the wrong order, okay? Because it matters what direction you're going. One of the things that uh, we had a comment when I was uh, interviewing for the course assistants, one of the things I asked them about is, uh, you know, what's one thing you could change about the course? And one of the things that they brought up was explaining programming a little bit better. So what I used to use for an example for that is in, does anybody know Cosmopolitan Magazine? Raise your hand if you've heard of Cosmopolitan Magazine. Usually referred to as just Cosmo. <laughs> All right, so in 1969, they had a story, a new story in Cosmopolitan Magazine recommending that women get into programming, okay? As a, you know, side career, as a career to do, because women were getting kind of more out of the house and more working. Um, and the part I really like about that story is, is two things. One, uh, we see not that many women in software these days, but it was highly encouraged in those days. There was a much higher percentage of women because men were more focused on hardware uh, at the time. Uh, and so programming was, was something that was just kind of on the side. And so it was considered okay, right? So find that mind blowing uh, story. But what I really like about the story is that it compared it to holding a dinner party, okay? So has anybody ever hold, held a dinner party? Everyone want to hear run a dinner party? All right, I would have been surprised, but you never know. All right, so a dinner party, generally speaking, you want to like invite all the guests. You want to make sure, typically speaking, like a formal dinner party, you actually do the seating, right? Or think like a wedding, right? You do the seating, you say, okay, this person's going to sit here, that person's going to sit there. You make sure that, you know, maybe couples are together, maybe who you want to be couples are together, maybe that you don't want, you know, uh, cousin Henry, uh, who really hates cousin Eliza, uh, sitting next to each other, that kind of stuff, right? So there's a lot of thinking that you want to put into that, right? So, so there's these steps you do. What you do is you figure out who you're inviting, then you tell them when to come, right? You tell them what to wear, then you tell them where to sit, then you serve them food, then they hopefully go away. Um, so, but when you serve them food, you also have to make all that food, right? So what do you use to make food typically, unless you're just, you know, a crazy chef? Yes, but what do you use to inform you how to make the food? A recipe. What is a recipe got? A set of steps, right? It's do step one, then do step two, then step three. Programming is just like making a recipe or that dinner party. You have a problem, okay? The problem is that you want to serve, you know, uh, let's say French fries to a group of your friends, okay? So there's a whole set of steps that you need to figure out in order to make that a reality. So all you're given is the problem. Make French fries for your friends. So first you have to identify who your friends are. You have to identify a way to contact them. Then you have to contact them. Then you have to settle on a date, which may be 3,000 emails later. 
Then you finally kind of get everybody there. You make sure all the people are seated in the right place. Uh, but then you also have to make the French fries. So to make the French fries, you have to go first get potatoes, right? Then you have to cut the potatoes and you have to cut them in a particular way. Do you like steak fries? Do you want uh, more like steak free fries? You know, there's different kinds of fries. So you got to cut them a particular way. Then you, if you really want to make good fries, you actually blanch them first. Then you actually deep fry them at a low temperature and then you deep fry them at a high temperature so that you can get, you know, really good French fries. Because the last thing you want to do is have all these people over and then serve them terrible French fries, right? Then again, hopefully then they all go away. So programming is exactly the same, okay? You, the, nothing about your kitchen knows how to make French fries, okay? Computers are stupid, like ridiculously stupid, okay? They know nothing. So, you, so the problem with that is that as a programmer, what you have to do is you have to go step by step by step, the tiniest little steps, because they're too stupid to understand anything intuitively. Okay, and that's the hardest thing most people find about programming because it's like, why doesn't it just get it, right? If you were talking to a human, you could say make French fries, okay? And they'll make bad French fries, but they will make French fries. Computers usually can't even do the first step. So as a result, you have to tell them every little tiny step. So we get back to programming. Does that help? All right. So. In a cell, what we do is we're going to execute the code that's in that cell. Now, Python is a, a very nice language in that it's very, uh, it's very friendly, okay? As in, it, it's very obvious what it's trying to do. So when you're doing Python, for example, if you want to do 2 plus 3, the way you do it is by 2 and then a plus sign and then a 3. And interestingly enough, it spits out 5, right? So you told it exactly what to do. Add 2 to 3. Okay, now we can also do things that are a little bit more complicated, right? And we can do bigger numbers, but it's exactly the same process, right? Add two plus three. So, however, this class is about data science, okay? And so when we talk about data science, we usually need a lot of data, right? So one of the ways, so there's a multitude of ways of getting that data, because the first thing we have to do is get it kind of into the computer, right? We need to have the computer know where the data is, what the data is. So uh, in Python and in the tools we're using in this class, there's a few different ways to do it. We're going to show you a simple way that we don't actually use very much. Normally, we have it locally so that it goes a little faster. Um, as, as you might imagine, if we were going to download, you know, whatever, a, a million or several million uh, word book, okay, it's going to take a minute, right? Like it's going to take a little while for it to get that data. So instead, we have most of it locally, uh, like in the computer, so that we don't have to do this step, which could take a while. In this case, they're both pretty small. So we're going to tell it to go get those. And it's actually already done. You see there's a number here already. So who here knows the book Huck Finn? All right. Well, can you give me a brief? Actually, I'll, I'll explain it because I don't want you to get too much away. Um, all right. So Mark Twain, famous author. Um, although his real name is Samuel Clemens, that was his writing name, um, wrote a, a very, very well-known book called Tom Sawyer, um, which is kind of like about growing up in the South. Uh, and then Huck Finn was actually kind of a sequel to the book. It actually follows one of the characters in Tom Sawyer kind of more closely. So it's not really about Tom Sawyer anymore, it's about this other character called Huck Finn. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Then we'll talk about little women a little more and I'll explain what that is when we get to it. So the first thing we wanna do is we got, went and downloaded the text of the whole book, which is sitting as a file out on the internet. Okay, so you could go to that URL and you could just see the whole book, okay? Then, um, oh, sorry, that, those first two lines are actually uh, going to get the book. And then the next one is, okay, now we wanna find anywhere that it says factors and we're gonna split that into a bunch of blocks, okay? So as you can see, it's a bunch of blocks. Um, so yeah, it's a lot, right? So, but it's each broken up by chapter. So what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna look at it that way, right? It's like, it's too complicated. It's too much data all at once. And as a human, we're not very good at understanding. So what we do instead, is let's try to simplify the data 
and make it at least a little more nicely structured. And the way we do that is we use what's called a table. Okay. So a table is one of those words that we use in programming land a lot, and it's kind of borrowed from English, but kind of not. So who knows what I mean by a table? Because we're not talking about a dining room table. Just like in an Excel spreadsheet, you could make it in a, like the not horizontal, the vertical line of the, uh, what, what you're trying to break down. All right, anybody else? It's consisted of rows and columns. Rows and columns? Yeah. Do you have something to add back there? Oh, sorry. I thought I thought I saw your hand go. That was uh, anybody else? Yeah. A way for data to be organized. So I usually refer to it as like a grid. Okay. Um, and so it's rows and columns, right? Okay. So each row usually has a, like some characterization about it, and each column has some characterization about it. So in this case, we made a table of chapters. We don't have very many columns. We just have a column called chapters, okay? And each row is a different chapter. Does that make sense? Okay, but each of these is gonna be, you know, thousands of words, right? So it's still pretty complicated. But we can start to, now we have it in a little bit, you know, nicer format than the original blob. Um, we can actually look at how many characters are used in each chapter. Oh, sorry, uh, I misspoke. Um, sometimes my examples get away from me. Um, so let's find out how many times the word Tom appears in every chapter, okay? Remember how I said, it's kind of like a sequel to Tom Sawyer, but it doesn't really, isn't really, it's really about another character. And you can see that here, right? Because you can see early in the book, Tom Sawyer, and that's the Tom we're talking about here, appears a fair amount but then kind of like really disappears for the vast majority of the book and then kind of returns towards the end of the book, okay? So this is how we can use data science, right? Is we can say, hey, I wanna know, is this really a sequel to Tom Sawyer or is it something slightly different, okay? Well, that clearly tells us that it's not really a sequel because it doesn't really feature Tom Sawyer that much, at least in the crux of the book, right? That makes sense? All right. So we're not going to get very far in my example stakes. We're almost out of time. Um, but so then let's look at Jim, okay? Who's another character. Now this character appears quite a lot, right? So they must be pretty important to the book, right? So what if I look at all of them, but let's put them in a table too, okay? Now we're going to omit some rows here. Um, but what do you notice that's interesting about these columns? Okay, remember I told you the book is called Huck Finn. The main character appears not that much. Any other theories? It's written in first person, so that's probably why his name doesn't appear a lot. Right, so it's, he's the narrator, and because it's a first person book, so as a result, his name doesn't actually appear as much as you would expect as like Jim, for example who is not the main character, right? Or is not the narrator, because when the narrator speaks, they say I, right? Or me, right? It's only when someone is talking to them that they might say their name, which obviously takes place less often in a first person book. All right, so, and then we can do is we can actually, because we didn't want to, like, if we just saw the numbers, it's still hard to tell. So instead, what we can do is what's called a visualization, okay? And a visualization is, intuitively enough, making something from data that is visual, right? Because humans can do a much better job understanding this picture than they can the columns of numbers, generally speaking, okay? So here we can see proof of that, right? Jim is clearly a pretty major character in the book. Tom is not, right? And Huck Finn is also weirdly not, except that we know that they're narrator. So therefore they may be, but we don't know for sure in this book because we don't necessarily have enough data. How might we find out if this book is uh, from the first person or third person without reading it, obviously? Search for I mean, 
Yeah, so look for I, me, and my, right? We can get some counts on I, me, and my, and that might tell us that it's a, you know, it's a first person narrative book. Um, you know, we might want to compare it to another book that we know is a third person book, right? Because who knows, right? Maybe, maybe that does appear a lot in third person books because we're kind of operating on the assumption in data science, this is much more common, right? Than it is for this particular case that we don't necessarily understand all the data. Okay, we have a lot of good intuition about this because most of us have read a book, right? And probably have read a book from a third person perspective and a first person perspective. So we have a good idea of what kind of things will happen. But assuming for the sake of argument that we don't know that much about the subject that we're looking at, we sometimes want to extrapolate information from it, but we need to verify that our extrapolations are good. All right, so I'm going to stop there because we only have five minutes left for that clock, which I hope is right. If I forgot to check, um, and it is. Uh, so, uh, any other questions? All right, and we will see you on Thursday.